It's so yeah. interesting. I was, I was going to say, actually, Eric, um, earlier that I saw Elon Musk uh, recently, met him for the first time, and he did a fascinating Q&A about you know, everything from colonising Mars to uh, humanoid robots and so on. But I also, we talked about X and his purchase of Twitter and then turning to X. One of the best things I've seen in terms of populist peer review is community notes now on X, where I often see things which are spinning around, which are complete nonsense. And then you see a very well-sourced community note killing it. And it does seem to have an effect because that in itself, because it's happening in the same medium, starts to also spread like wildfire and tends to kill them quite quickly. Uh, are you a fan of of what Elon is doing with, with X? Is this helping sure, in terms of not, populist not, peer reviewing? Right. Yeah. Again, this is, you know, this is one of these Wild West conversations where it's not peer review. The whole concept of peer review is peer. Mm. And community notes is community, right? And so in a certain sense, the point is it's an anti-peer review. It's working pretty well right now. Um, but mm. keep in mind that Wikipedia worked pretty well until people figured out how to game it. Right. So my concern is, is that what you're looking at with peer review and with uh, community notes, which is anti-peer review, if mm. you will, um, is technologies that are in the process of being probed and gamed. And just to re refute what Tom was saying before, Tom, I don't disagree at all. We ha are going to have to deal with the Candace phenomenon. But the reason the Candace phenomenon is happening is that you don't have any expert dissident opinion. If you have five professors shout me down that I don't know what I'm talking about with respect to peer review, uh, and I happen to be completely right, I will be told that I'm not an academic despite the fact that we all speak the same language and have the same credentials. What is going on is, is that the world is not crying out for Candace Owen. It's crying out for where is the physician with my daughter's interests at heart? Mm. Where is the biologist who's willing to stand up to a Tony Fauci and say, I completely disagree? Why is it that we keep having these fake consensuses? And these consensuses are basically determined by getting rid of the people who won't shut up and who won't sit down and who won't sing from the hymnal. And what I'm trying to say is what you just saw was an interchange between two colleagues with a great deal of love and respect for each other on an issue where I'm claiming that the good professor is simply an error. And if you had somebody saying uh, that around the, the Wuhan lab and the origin mm -hmm. of COVID or the potential danger of the vaccines or the liability regime in which they were negotiated, that this is an abomination, that we can't sue the manufacturers, uh, you would have a totally different world. Nobody would be listening to Candace Owens. They would be trying to track Jay Bhattacharya. They would be trying to track mm -hmm all of the experts who were standing up with their interests and hearts. The big problem in the United States is we used to have experts in the right chairs who dissented. And now what you have is a group of people who know to keep their head down. Brian, um, just want to end with just quick thoughts from you and, and Tom before we finish. Give me some hope about the future of science. It clearly, I think, is indisputable that science and the integrity of science and scientists has never been under a bigger attack than it is today. A lot of it fueled by conspiracy theorists and social media. Give me some hope for the future of science and its integrity. Well, I think the hope comes from you know, my students, the people that I work with, the incredible breakthroughs that I've been witness to, both personally and part of a team of 300 scientists that are working to uncover what happened during the first nanosecond in the cosmos's history. What kind of breakthroughs do we now unlock knowing that the universe is suffused with dark energy? What do we learn about the future possibly with new technology like high temperature, room temperature, superconductivity, or perhaps fusion? That's never been a more exciting time to be a, a scientist and to hear about science, it's, its best days are behind us. I think that's nonsense. On the other hand, we have to guard against conspiracy theories and, and flat earthers and all sorts of anti-vaxxers and things like that, because there is always a grain of truth. As Isaac Asimov said, if you believe the earth is flat, you're wrong. 
But if you believe it's perfectly round two, you're also wrong, but you're less wrong. And I think that what we want to do as scientists is not be held to this impossible secret service level of we can't make a single mistake. Recognize that we do make mistakes, but science is self-correcting. And part of that self-correction mechanism has to do with being analyzed by your peers. Whatever Eric and I disagree with about in the past, today peer review is, is perhaps, as I like to say, it's the worst system for gauging scientific process, except for all the rest. Tom? All right, so the thing that I really wanna make sure that I'm being heard on, uh, Brian, cause you keep repeating, we shouldn't be held to this uh, team, SEAL team six level of perfection. What I'm saying is silent, uh, science has a branding problem. You guys created a branding problem. I'll just say during COVID where it was, uh, hey, everybody listen to us and everything is gonna be fine. Um, masks don't work by the way, but save them for the health workers because they need them. It's like, so everyone's brain starts sketching out. Also, no one has talked about social media yet. Social media, that this is done. The, the horses are out of the stable. The toothpaste is all over the floor. The genie has flown out of the bottle. We are living in a reality where everybody is a publisher. Everybody is going to say things and people are screaming out for Candace Owens. I'm telling you right now, as somebody, I'm almost sure I'm gonna disagree with every word out of her mouth. And yet I am utterly fascinated by how she has already captured people in terms of their imagination, because this is what they want. As a marketer, I can tell you, you guys are terrible. Like if I have to market you, oh God, even though I look at Eric and I'm like, is this the smartest human I've ever encountered? For sure. Do I want him at my house just whispering in my ear all the things to do? Absolutely, my life would be way better. However, from a marketing perspective, oh dear God. So it's like we have a much <laughs> bigger challenge that we have to overcome. And Candace doesn't have that problem. She's electrifying. She captures what people want to hear. And what I'm saying is the service that you guys can now play in the world that we live in is to say science isn't about being right. Science is about two things. Number one, the pursuit of utility. Einstein's breakthroughs matter because they give us GPS and nuclear energy. That's the only reason that they matter. And the second thing mm. is, we know we're wrong about a whole lot of stuff. And so our job is just go through what are all the things we're wrong about that are stopping us. And I hope I'm not talking out of class, Eric, oh, please God. But Eric has said to me many times, we ought to be traveling the cosmos. And we aren't because string theory has gotten stuck. Exactly. So you have to get new ideas. You have to break the old paradigms in order to get the utility that you want. And if we judge every idea by its utility and not by where it comes from, we'll be in a much better place. You know that the best thing about this debate, Tom, is that it's actually by having this kind of conversation on a platform like this that is watched globally in pretty big numbers now that we can probably get to where you want to get science to.